prey evolved. And so now we're going to look at the adaptations that the prey has developed. And these are quite interesting to us as uh, people studying community ecology because these show very, very advanced evolutionary uh, concepts that we're going to be looking at, evolutionary results. Adaptations by prey. So now we're focusing on the prey. Um, first, we're going to be focusing on animal adaptations, the adaptations that animals are able to do. And we'll also be looking at the adaptations that plants are able to do um, on the side over here. So we'll do plants on the side a little bit later. So animals are evolving very, very nice ways to uh, avoid, that's our idea here, predator avoidance strategies. Avoid who? The predators, of course. Animals can do things like uh, mechanical defenses, so they have mechanical avoidance strategies. Um, mechanical, they also have chemical uh, defenses to use, so we'll write mechanical. They have chemical defenses. Mechanical are things like um, sharp quills or shells. Those are mechanical defenses. Chemical would be things like poison. Um, animals also have the ability to flee when they want to just run away. They want to be uh, just run or hide from the predators. That's another adaptation. So they can chemically uh, avoid the predator. They can mechanically avoid. They can flee. They can also um, live in groups. That's a big one. And that's something that we actually saw in our macroevolution lecture, the idea that some animals will live in groups and then there will be predator calls. They're going to be uh, there to alert the other members of the group that a predator is nearby. And we looked at that idea of inclusive fitness. Um, all playing a big role in this community interaction of predation, this plus-minus interaction. So these are some basic ideas that animals can do. Um, a big idea to understand um, within ecology is this idea of aposomatic coloration. This is a very fancy evolutionary mechanism that we'll spend a bit of time looking at. Aposomatic coloration. This is a very interesting one because this is something that many people already know about. This is the idea of having warning coloration. Aposomatic coloration simply means warning coloration. This is something that a prey has evolved over many, many millions of years. The idea that these organisms actually don't hide. So they don't flee away from the predators, which seems counterintuitive. And they actually have such bright colors on them. They have such bright colors, such obvious patterns, that these colors are simply going to be advertising to the prey, to the predators. And this seems counterintuitive. It seems like it should not work in nature, but yet it does. And how do we know that? Well, we can look at a very nice example of a brightly colored organism, of a very obviously colored organism that doesn't hide, that shows up. And that example could be something like um, milkweed. Milkweed is actually not the organism that's of interest, but milkweed actually is a plant. And it's a plant that has toxic ingredients. It is made of toxic ingredients that are going to be consumed by somebody. So some individuals, specifically insects, are able to eat milkweed. I'm just going to squeeze this in on the bottom. Some insects, very few actually, some insects can eat. They can eat the milkweed even though it has these toxic ingredients. And because only some can eat this, there's actually minimal competition for this type of plant. So I'm just going to write in small letters over here, min comp for minimal competition. So because some insects eat this, they actually build up the toxins within them. So the toxins actually will build up. They will build up within this uh, insect, and so much so that eventually the insect itself, after consuming the milkweed over and over and over again, will become toxic. And insects are often eaten by other organisms. They often are prey themselves. And what they're going to be uh, happen to them is that they're going to develop aposomatic coloration. They're going to develop a warning bright color within them. So they're going to be toxic with bright colors that tell other organisms, that tell predators specifically, do not eat me, I do not taste good. And that is because of their own diet, their own toxic buildup. Uh, a good example of this, and I'll just do this on the side, is the monarch caterpillar, which turns into, of course, the monarch butterfly. 
That monarch caterpillar has very bright coloration, very obvious patterns that are not hidden, that are very conspicuous and advertised to the predators, yet predators don't eat this. Why? Because they are full of toxins due to their milkweed diet that builds up. So it's a very nice ecological, full of interaction example of adaptations by prey. In addition, there's also the idea of cryptic coloration, which is a bit of the opposite, let's say, of the one that we mentioned before. Cryptic coloration is the opposite of aposomatic coloration. This is not going to be the conspicuous coloration, but it's actually going to be inconspicuous. It's actually going to be um, coloration that's cryptic, that's uh, used to blend into the surroundings. So this is sort of like the idea of camouflage, two ends of a spectrum that can be utilized. Warning coloration and blending coloration. And finally, the last thing about animals that we'll cover is this idea of mimicry, which is a very, very nice uh, evolutionary example that we see in this arms race. In terms of mimicry, we have two types. We have Batesian mimicry, and we also have Malarian mi mimicry, named after the two people that... Uh, figured out what this type of mimicry is in nature. Batesian mimicry is defined as when we have a defenseless species, and we're only talking about one species, so one letter P. In this defenseless species, it's actually protected. It protects itself by resembling, not actually being, but by resembling, it's mimicking a dangerous species and that dangerous species is one dangerous species so we'll write dangerous SP defenseless species protected by resembling dangerous species good example of Batesian mimicry would be something like a non venomous snake and a venomous snake the non venomous snake is considered the mimic of the situation and who is it mimicking it's mimicking a venomous snake which is considered the model in a Batesian mimicry example. So that's a very nice adaptation by the prey. That non-venomous snake is prey to other organisms. And so what it's going to do is it's going to mimic something that's venomous and have a Batesian mimicry example. Malarian mimicry, on the other hand, is a bit different. This is when we have many different species. Many different species, they converge on the fact that they all actually resemble each other. All resemble each other so much so that they all actually are dangerous and this is sort of a team effort of this prey to tell all predators that we all are dangerous that we all don't taste good that we all have aposomatic coloration and that's a cumulative malarian mimicry effort that's going to tell everyone avoid me because I do not taste good so we have two different types of mimicry that is seen in the animal world the final thing that we'll conclude on are the plants plants actually don't have to stop um, this what we're seeing here is this carnivorous predator uh, prey adaptation we're actually going to be looking in plants the idea of having to stop they have to stop not carnivory but herbivory the idea that some individuals some predators are going to eat plants and that's called herbivory and herbivory is of course a plus minus relationship somebody benefits the predator and somebody doesn't the prey and so plants will develop physical adaptations that you probably have seen yourself and these physical adaptations are things very obvious like spines thorns, all of which are physical adaptations, even things like thick leaves that are developed over a course of evolutionary time to stop the predator from eating the plant. And there also can be chemical adaptations that are quite simple, like poison. The plant can be quite poisonous to the prey, uh, to the predator, and thus we have an adaptation by the prey. So overall, what we see in this predation relationship is plus minus. One benefits and the other doesn't. And thus we have created an evolutionary arms race between predator and prey, both of which are going to co-evolve to have the adaptations that predators that we saw and the adaptations of prey that we see in great, great detail within the animal and plant worlds.